Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, webinar um, organized by uh, members of Landmark Chambers. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Tim Mould. Uh, I'm the chair for this uh, short but I hope very helpful session. Um, the subject matter of this uh, webinar is can uh, NHS trusts seek Section 106 funding from developers to meet the costs of extra patients arising from a housing development. Uh, I'm very pleased indeed that uh, we've had such a high level of attendance and I hope you'll find the presentations that we're going to hear and the discussion both useful and informative. Um, joining me today are uh, my colleagues, uh, David Forsdick, Queen's Council, David Locke, Queen's Council, and David Elvin, Queen's Council. Um, before I introduce them, uh, may I just uh, mention one or two housekeeping points. Your microphones are automatically muted, so you will not need to adjust your local settings. We very much welcome questions throughout the session. Please submit them via the text in the Q&A section, which may be found at the top or the bottom of your screen. If you would like to remain anonymous uh, when asking a question, please make sure you tick the send anonymously box before submitting your question. We're going to try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentations. However, if we can't answer all of them, we'll follow them up after the event. We're recording this webinar uh, you'll receive a link to the presentation and the recording shortly after the event closes. And uh, if your connection is lost at any point during the webinar, uh, please do rejoin the meeting by clicking on the original link once more. So uh, just before um, we begin with our first speaker, let me introduce them briefly. They'll be familiar to many, if not all of you. Firstly, uh, David Forsdick, QC, uh, David, is um, a very experienced practitioner in the field of uh, public uh, and uh, planning law. He works uh, mainly at the interface between those two disciplines. He has undertaken many cases assessing the justification for Section 106 contributions in various contexts, particularly affordable housing, and has advised several local authorities on how to address the issue with which this seminar is concerned. David Locke, is uh, uh, one of the most, if not the most experienced experts at the bar on the field of national health service law. Uh, and uh, uh, for those of you who have work in that field, he needs no introduction whatsoever. He's a very experienced practitioner in public law across a range of different fields of, 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 uh, of, of public administration. David Elvin uh, is, uh, as many of you will know, one of the most experienced and highly regarded uh, planning practitioners at the bar and has been for many years. Uh, he is uh, extremely experienced in uh, uh, public law uh, litigation, particularly in relation to planning matters, uh, and is also uh, active uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the field of seeking planning permission and pursuing planning appeals uh, through inqu the inquiry process. And uh, many of you will have worked with him in that field. So there we are, a very uh, experienced and uh, knowledgeable uh, trio of speakers. Without further ado, I will hand over to uh, David Fordstick. Good afternoon. I'm going to be speaking on the argument in favour of uh, uh, trusts securing contributions to NHS funding shortfall. Um, uh, in the next 15 minutes or so. The, the issue, you'll all be aware, is um, arises in the following way. First of all, of course, um, cap capital contributions to physical social infrastructure. So the important words there, physical infrastructure, so capital um, and uh, uh, capital contributions towards infrastructure, uh, such as schools and medical centres in conjunction with new housing are commonplace and, and frankly anyone who objects to them in principle would be uh, flogging a dead horse. Um, uh, some NHS trusts historically and, and many more recently have identified what they perceive to be a short-term time lag in their revenue funding formula. So not capital, this is about revenue. Um, a, a shortfall in their uh, revenue funding formula 
which is claimed to have the result that they do not secure adequate revenue funding for provision of services. So that's revenue funding for services, not capital funding for infrastructure in the early years of new development to meet the needs of the new residents. And they thus claim that the revenue shortfall represents a burden arising from the development, which the development should bear. And of course, that then brings into rather stark focus um, the issue as to whether you could have revenue contribution for services rather than capital contributions for infrastructure under Section 106 obligations uh, and the circumstances in which they could be claimed. The issue most recently has emerged in, um, I think, uh, the following way. There's, there's obviously uh, lots of decisions that I could refer to, but the two main ones I'm going to be referring to are these. First of all, in the Tamworth case, the Secretary of State, after a full inquiry at which the issue was fully addressed, refused to require such a contribution. Uh, it was concluded that revenue contributions in such circumstances were not justified. The NHS Trust, however, challenged the decision uh, and before the hearing of the challenge, the Section 288 challenge, but after permission to challenge had been granted, so the case was arguable, uh, that part of the case on the NHS contributions was settled. I've, I've tried a number of times to find out what the terms of the settlement were, but I um, um, always told it's confidential, so nobody knows in detail what the terms were. Uh, but a payment of some level was apparently agreed, so the trust got something. Whether they got very much is a, is a mute point. But the upshot of that chain of events was that the court was being asked to determine the legality of such contributions, uh, but then uh, uh, was, uh, didn't have the opportunity to do so or to provide de definitive guidance. There's two points from that case that I think are of some significance for the discussion. The first is that permission to apply for uh, under Section 288 was granted by the court, so it must have been arguable. And secondly, the decision was made to settle the case, and so there must have been a, uh, a view uh, that there was some risk associated with it. And I, I put it no higher than that, that there's some, some risk associated with the claim of the NHS trusts. I, uh, given that history and given that the, the issue was not finally determined by the High Court in Tainmouth, I, I, I don't accept the proposition that is put forward by some people that the Tainmouth is the leading word on where the Secretary of State has got to in his decision making on these matters. Subsequently, so subsequent to the Tainmouth judicial review being settled, in the Lebry case, the Secretary of State found that an NHS revenue contribution met the regulation 122 tests. Now that the circumstances of that case are really quite important. That there were, the issue wasn't a principal controversial issue between the parties and so the inspector didn't have to make conclusions on them. However, uh, both the main parties, in fact, I'm sorry, I should say all the, all the main parties were represented by highly experienced legal teams and they all entered into a statement of common ground uh, that the NHS contribution met the 122 tests. The Secretary of State uh, didn't have a detailed fact-finding jurisdiction because it wasn't a principal controversial issue, but he did have to make a conclusion as to whether the SIL tests were met, and he expressly and specifically found that the regulation 122 tests were met in respect of the revenue contribution. So we have, on the one hand, we have Tainmouth with the Secretary of State being appro approached to uh, uh, being opposed to such contributions on the facts, and then in favour of them in principle in Nedbury. Um, the former was unchallenged and settled, the latter was common ground. And so the, the sort of precedent effect of either of those two cases is rather dubious. In preparing for today, I have read through loads of other decision letters where this was an issue, and most of most of the time it's common ground and therefore not subject to much discussion in the in the decision letter. But I think it's fair to say that the preponderance of situation of uh, decisions is that um, NHS trusts have been allowed, if they produce the right evidence, uh, to claim uh, such contributions. <clears throat> 
resolving the issue. I haven't got much time to go through this, but um, uh, uh, but obviously in the, in the absence of a high court judgment, there's lots to argue about. And what the consequence of that has been that there's been effectively a battle of advices over the last couple of years, with one QC for a developer saying X and one QC for the NHS saying something else. And with the local authority in the middle having to decide which way to jump. Um, in at least two recent cases that I'm aware of, where I've been acting for the local authority, um, there has been a battle of advices between the two um, sides. Um, and um, in both, the local authority ultimately decided to require uh, multi-million pound contributions, uh, and the developer in both of them, I think, um, reluctantly agreed. But of course, that doesn't tell you the answer. That, that it, it just tells you what people have decided as a matter of commercial um, uh, imperatives, I guess. Um, and so we won't know whether such contributions are required until either we get a fully reasoned uh, inspector's decision that isn't challenged, or we get a judicial review outcome in the uh, courts. Now, the first obvious question is, does the funding gap exist? Does it actually exist? And the essential for, uh, precursor to any claim is that there is an evidenced factual funding shortfall. It's no good to assert a, a shortfall. Um, and indeed, that's what some uh, trusts simply say. They simply write in saying three million pound shortfall, can we have it please? And that clearly isn't going to do the job. There has to be an evidenced factual funding shortfall as an essential entry level uh, requirement. But then there's got to be uh, that, that evidence has got to establish the shortfall in a rather complex matrix. Um, now, David Locke, you see, is going to be going through the legal analysis in a few moments, and he's going to show you that in principle, no gap should arise. If, um, if the various NHS bodies did their jobs properly and applied the rules properly and applied the um, appeal and determination rules correctly, no, no gap should arise. However, NHS trusts oft, often claim that that's a theoretical view of the world and it's not borne out in reality. And they claim to be able to produce a chapter and verse as to how the shortfall actually arises with the figures on the facts of their specific NHS trust. I regard that exercise as an essential requirement. They must be able to explain how and why on the facts it arises, despite the legal framework under which it shouldn't arise. Um, just to give you an example of that, in, in a case I was involved with quite recently, the head of clinical commissioning, um, a professor of um, surgery, and the head of the trust provided very detailed witness evidence, including detailed budgets and detailed uh, economic analysis to demonstrate what they said was um, the existence of the gap, which they said they couldn't avoid. And it's that sort of evidence base that seems to me to be um, the essential starting point for a claim. Uh, and if an LPA is provided with that sort of analysis, it might come to the view that it's got no evidential base to disagree with the, with the NHS trust. I'm not going to have time to look at the, the points there, but they'll be on the sheet that comes through to you. The next question is, well, if there is a funding gap, what are the implications of that funding gap? Um, so for the purposes of this slide, I'm going to assume that it's been demonstrated under the previous slide that there is a funding gap. And the next question is, what are the implications of that gap? Again, David Locke is going to show you this is a matter of legal principle. There shouldn't be any. Um, and therefore, the starting point is rather poor for an NHS trust because the legal framework suggests there shouldn't be any um, uh, implications of, of any funding gap. There shouldn't be a funding gap in the first place, and there shouldn't be any funding implications of any funding gap if there is one. Uh, but NHS trusts tend to try to show that, that on the factual evidence, um, uh, it demonstrates the contrary, that there are actual practical real world consequences for patients of the uh, gap. And this will always be a matter of law and evidence, but issues that might be relevant to this are, can it, or can it, the trust, or does it, uh, that does the shortfall impact upon the nature and timing of the treatment available in the locality? Does it in fact delay treatment? Does it require more rationing 
our local services unaffected, our local services still as before, is the funding caught up later? Is there some sort of payback mechanism? Do the statutory duties bite to mean the shortfall doesn't impact services? Is the, uh, is the shortfall covered by short-term contingency and reserves to, to ensure that there are no implications? And those are all the sorts of questions I would expect a trust to try to address in its evidence. And in the example I was just uh, uh, suggest, uh, 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 giving you a few moments ago, uh, the evidence, the very, very detailed evidence from the trust addressed all those matters and sought to demonstrate that there were implications which arose from the funding gap which they said they'd established. Plainly, if, if there's no impact on services, it's probably impossible um, to see how contributions are necessary to make the development acceptable. So I think you need a demonstrated funding gap and demonstrated adverse real world implications of it to the existing area. And those are two sort of entry level requirements. But one is still then left with, can the SIL tests be met? And I've set out here some of the basic normal requirements for SIL. I'm not going to spend any time on it. But the normal logic for 106 contributions is that the development gives rise to a new need or new demand or pressure, which wouldn't otherwise exist, and which is thus an inherent feature of the development, which needs to be mitigated in order to make the development acceptable in planning terms. So for example, absent a new school build, there will be inadequate school places or absent a bus contribution, the local location would be inadequately served by public transport or absent a new GP surgery, there'd be too much pressure on the existing surgery. In all those cases, unless the issue was addressed, the development would be um, unacceptable. But how can that apply to revenue contributions? And the question, the third real main question is, are revenue contributions objectionable in principle? It's often said um, that 106 financial contributions can only be for capital spending on infrastructure and not revenue spending on services. Indeed, if you look at the NPPF and the NPPG, it uses the term infrastructure um, in a number of places. Um, however, I've only got a couple of minutes left, but it, however, there's, there's a number of situations which show there isn't a hard and fast rule against revenue contributions. First of all, there's nothing in the legislation or guidance which says there is. There's nothing that says you can't have um, uh, such contributions. Uh, and there's three situations in which, uh, which immediately spring to mind where such contributions are required. First of all, to pump prime public transport, uh, paying for bus services with revenue support to get them going in the early years of development, or green travel plans where money is paid to residents to encourage them to, uh, to help them pay their fares on public transport to encourage them to adopt sustainable choices. And then in the SPA and SAC world, there's two sides of the coin for mitigating harm um, by recreational pressure on SPAs. One is that you pay towards the capital cost of a, a, a semi-natural uh, green space. But the other is that you pay um, a sum towards the management and monitoring costs of the existing condition of the SPA. And those are revenue services contributions. So I don't think there's anything in principle against revenue uh, contributions. And the fourth question, the final, is you've, it's got to be made planning, uh, made acceptable in planning terms. There's got to be a link between the uh, funding gap and its implications and the planning system. So what is the link between the shortfall and the planning? And in the final few seconds, what I'm going to do is just read out the way I would put it if push came to shove. So the argument would go, if the shortfall exists, the development will increase pressure without providing the wherewithal to cope with that pressure. And because of the consequent implication on existing services and existing population is thereby unacceptable, and development which does not consume its own smoke and passes burdens onto others which would be relevant in planning terms because and this is the fundamental point moving new population into an area through development without adequate nhs resources would be unacceptable in planning terms just as moving in people without adequate public transport or adequate school places or adequate protection of the spas would be unacceptable in planning terms.
we obviously won't know who's right on that argument until we get a high court decision. But that's what I would say if I was for um, the trust. Thank you very much indeed, David. Um, we'll move straight on to David Locke. Uh, we've got a few questions, but we'll save those up until, until the end of the session. David Locke. Tim, thank you very much. Um, uh, um, uh, I have to make a, a few confessions before I, I start this talk. The first and most, most important of which is I'm not a planning lawyer. Um, I'm an NHS and public lawyer, um, and therefore um, anything I say about planning law um, uh, should be uh, treated with the contempt it deserves. However, um, this is about the NHS, and the first slide here sets out uh, some of the background of the NHS. Um, it, it's worth noting that Nigel Lawson observes in 1992 that the NHS is the closest thing the English have to a religion with those who practice it regarding themselves as a priesthood um, and uh, I think as I get, continue to practice it does occur to me that that is increasingly true. Um, also the pressure on NHS budgets is permanently there uh, that's a quote from Lord Bingham in 1995 I don't think the situation is any worse today um, the NHS never has enough money um, uh, both collectively, as of course the NHS as a whole, um, and each individual part of it. Um, so why not make the developers pay? Well, um, I'm going to start from the proposition that as a public lawyer, my instinct is the developer should pay, and, and they're making profits, and they should feed their resources into the NHS. Um, but I think, as uh, Dave rightly said, pay for what? Um, because as I understand it, the purpose of Section 106 agreements is to make planning acceptable uh, development acceptable, which otherwise wouldn't be acceptable to, to mitigate the impacts of a development. Um, now, one major impact, of course, of any housing development is that more people arrive in an area and they'll increase local demand for a whole range of public services, NHS, education, fire, refuse collection, so on, all of which are funded through taxation. And these people obviously also pay their local and national taxes, which fund the services. Um, so in principle, it seems rather strange to um, ask a developer to pay for what are essentially services that are paid for by people that come into the area that pay their taxes. Um, but the NHS hospital trusts have developed a, a, a system for saying that the developer should pay the cost of catching up, funding the extra patients while the NHS funding system catches up with a number of people on the ground that the trust has to treat. Um, so that NHS bodies seek revenue funding for a future uh, occasion for two or three years until it's claimed the NHS funding system will pay for the full cost of treating the extra patients. And one of the points about evidence in this case is, is I think it's really important to note, this is not evidence about what's happened in the past. At the planning stage, almost by definition, the house has not yet been built, the people are not there, and they won't be there almost likely not in the next financial year, but probably not in the financial year after that or the financial year after that. So we're looking at the funding regimes for NHS trusts, not this year or probably even next year, but in two or three or four years time, when the development will be completed, people will move in and they'll start falling over in the garden um, and uh, breaking their ankle and turning up at the local A&E. So that raises three questions. First of all, is it factually correct that NHS funding systems have this gap? Is it true? Is it factually correct? Secondly, if there is a gap, is that how the system is supposed to work in law? And thirdly, what can and should NHS bodies do who see the need to treat extra patients in future years? In other words, can they avoid the gap? So we're in the in the what can we do about the gap? Now, how does the NHS funding work? I have blatantly taken this slide from the King's Fund. I apologise if the um, uh, uh, detail is um, hard to read. But in essence, there's a big pipeline in the system. And money starts as voted by, the, uh, by Parliament to the Department of Health. They, the allocation to the Department of Health is approximately £130 billion a year. Of that, about 112 billion, maybe more these days, to cope with the pandemic, goes 
um, uh, from the Department of Health to um, the NHS Commissioning Board, which operates under the name of NHS England. NHS England then allocates money to local clinical commissioning groups and enters into a series of contracts up and down the country for specialist services. And those specialist services um, add up to about um, uh, 20 billion. Um, of the 84 billion that goes to clinical commissioning groups, they then enter, enter into contracts with a whole range of providers, including um, trusts uh, and NHS foundation trusts. And finally, these are the people that actually provide services to patients. The commissioner provider divide that operates in the NHS means that NHS commissioners, that is NHS England and CCGs, who don't treat any patients, their job is to place contracts with NHS providers under which providers treat patients. And the providers of NHS services are NHS trusts, foundation trusts, GP practices, dental practices, community trusts, private and third sector contractors, Marie Curie and Spire are, are examples. So all of those, all providers are sent, are provided with money, not under a funding allocation, but under what is almost always an annual contract. Now, the money therefore flows from the Department of Health to NHS England, and that's an administrative allocation. Then from NHS England to CCGs, that's an administrative allocation, is governed by complex formula allocations to divide the 84 billion pound fairly between CCGs. And then from, from NHS England and CCGs, I should say, to providers, um, under annually agreed contracts and their standard form contracts. And then there are some very particular rules for NHS pricing of services in chapter four, sections 115 following of the Health and Social Care Act 2012. So the first question is, do CCGs get extra funding for new developments? And the simple answer is yes, if they're planned. The complex answer is to look at the Technical Guide to Allocation Formulae and Pace of Change 2019-20-2023-24 Revenue Allocations document, um, which is largely unintelligible NHS management gobbledygook, but does have within it um, uh, a confirmation that the allocations start on the basis of the number of patients registered with local GPs, bearing in mind CCGs are um, member organizations, the local GP practices, and then they're projected forward using ONS, Office of National Statistics projections for resident populations in CCG areas. Um, and so um, if there is planned development, so a local authority has published a plan and anticipates it um, uh, uh, will increase the number of houses and increase the number of people, that comes part of the ONS. And so that is built into the funding formula for CCGs. But of course that won't necessarily assist trusts because trusts are under contract to the CCG and they won't necessarily get any part of that additional funding. So how are funders funded? Well, the NHS operates a managed market with a measure of competition between providers. The pricing of NHS contracts is governed by rules in Chapter 4 of the Health and Social Care Act 2012. This was originally a payment by results model or a PBR model, as it was known. And the principle was the money followed the patient. So every patient who attended A&E or was referred by a GP for a hip replacement um, or cancer treatment attracted a fee. And the total payable under the contract between the CCG and the trust was an amalgamation of all of the individual treatment fees for all of the patients who've been referred over the year. Uh, and then fees for the individual episodes of treatment, because you get a different amount, depending on whether you turn up for, for A&E or whether you go for cancer treatment or a hip replacement, were all set as um, episodes of care within the national tariff. And for a trust operating under PBR, there can of course, by definition, be no NHS gap. The more patients that turn up, the more patients are treated, the more claims are made, the more money flows. It's, it's a payment per patient. So if the, the NHS was working under PBR, um, 
this argument would simply not operate because the money and the risk therefore flows back to the CCG. But life is not that simple. There are rules in section 117 and 118 of the 2012 Act which allow NHS bodies to bundle services and to vary the national tariff arrangements by using what are called local variations and local modifications. And guidance recommends now that CCGs use these powers to enter into what's called block contracts, which means the same price gets paid to a provider of services, a local NHS trust that runs the hospitals, regardless of how many patients are referred. So the risk effectively is transferred from the CCG to the trust. And of course, in one sense, this is logical because the trust is running the same infrastructure, it likely have the same levels of staff, and what happens in the NHS in practice is that if there are more patients, you flex ways of working to meet the increases in demand. So how is the annual price for, an, for a contract fixed? Well, here there are legal requirements and, and there are, is common NHS practice, and to some extent, they part company. Um, this is the, this departure between what the law requires and what happens in practice, it, it may be part of the example, reason for the NHS gap. If the legal rules are followed, there should be no NHS gap for predictable increases in demand. If the rules are not followed, there may be an NHS gap, despite predictable increases in demand. And that's the question uh, I, I pose both for Dave is, is whether developers should subsidize the consequences of mandatory rule breaking or uh, breaking mandatory rules by NHS bodies. So what are the rules? The rules for fixing a block contract price, that is the effect of the, the sum that's paid by the CCG to the trust, are in, stat are, are in a document called the national tariff. And there are complicated rules about how an annual price or even in theory, a price over multiple years is required to be negotiated. And paragraph 287 of these mandatory rules requires the price to be fixed in the best interests of patients today and in the future. And there are a whole series of other rules. Essentially, the issue is that the CCG is mandated to pay a fair price for the predicted patient flows for the predicted types of treatment. Um, if the rules are followed and there's a predicted patient increase as a result of a housing development, again, by definition, there cannot be a funding gap. Um, so what are the myths? The first myth is that contract prices are set by the number of patients on last year's GP lists. And I've seen a witness statement from a finance director of an NHS trust saying this. Um, now, the answer to that is this is part of the CCG funding and it's irrelevant to the national tariff rules. Second myth, contract values are based on patient flows last year. Answer, no, that's not how the national tariff works. Myth three is all of the trust funding comes from the CCG contract. Not correct. Trusts get substantial money from other services, other sources. Um, there's direct funding from um, NHS England under the control total system, which I can't possibly explain in the time available. And the NHS England department lends money to, to trusts because they're all in deficit. And therefore the practical effect of making developer contributions is not actually to benefit patients in most cases, it's simply to reduce the amount of central subsidy that's provided by uh, uh, the Department of Health or NHS England. So why do we have planning conditions imposed? Well, it does seem to me that the present situation arises from a profound asymmetry of information and understanding, because who in the planning world outside uh, uh, the planning world outside the NHS understands the complex systems of NHS funding and finance? Who can explain what rules ought to arise in future years when the patients arrive and how the contracts are I mean, negotiated? very few, I suggest, within the planning world. Um, and in the absence of clarity, the impenetrable jargon of NHS management has, I'm afraid, stepped in to create a small scale industry in making these claims. Um, I don't think they work in, in theory. Um, um, so in summary, for planned large scale developments, 
CCGs are funded for extra patients arising from predicted patient flows because planned operation, planned population increases are included in ONS projections. Trusts are partly funded, oh, I'm sorry, uh, by um, block contract payments, and the rules require a fair price, so there should be no NHS gap. And any extra funding will almost certainly just reduce the need for central subsidy, not actually benefit patients attending at the trust. I'm now going to pass over to David um, uh, Elvin, um, who will um, uh, 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 oh, no, pass back to Tim. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, that was a whistle stop tour through NHS funding schemes. Um, I hope it was vaguely intelligible. Many thank you. Many thanks, David. Um, we will move straight to David Elvin. Uh, and I know there's a burgeoning debate going on on the uh, on the Q&A, but uh, perhaps we can touch on that when David has, uh, has given his presentation. David Elvin. Thanks, Tim. Uh, yes, thank you, Josh. Fortunately, um, David Forsdick uh, has uh, gone through a, a number of the key matters in his slides, and I'm going to have slides which are more detailed than I'm going to speak to. It might be worth just uh, bearing in mind a, a recent uh, reform policy study in Section 106 planning contributions in the NHS to see just how inept uh, a number of NHS trusts are at actually maximising the money that they're given through 106 contributions. And it does raise with uh, a number of questions, not least those focused on by David Locke a moment ago, as to what degree, uh, to what degree NHS trusts are actually helping themselves uh, in pursuing these matters. That re reform policy report is worth reading in more detail. Um, there are a number of issues which have already been referred to, which I'm not going to go to. There are legal principles which are uh, uh, relevant to bear in mind. There is the point that a planning obligation must serve a planning purpose and there must be a direct and not a trivial link with the development and that's the Elphick uh, develop Elsic Development Company case in the Supreme Court. Now uh, clearly uh, it would be argued well uh, on, on uh, uh, Dave Fosdick's basis there's a direct link. However this really does come down to issues uh, uh, of principle in some cases, particularly if uh, the link uh, to the gap is one which is self-generated by the NHS trust. In other words, um, uh, there is a breach of, of mandatory uh, provisions, as David Locke has described, uh, and certainly to the extent that the funds that are sought by way of contribution simply disappear into the black hole of the trust's finances, one has to question whether it meets the requirements in paragraph 61 of Lord Hodge's judgment. Similarly, in the resilient energy case, uh, a planning material consideration, uh, it has to arise directly from the development. And if the uh, issue arises through mandatory rule breaking by the NHS Trust, that there isn't taking advantage of what genuinely is a national funding mechanism, it has to be questioned as to whether this is a planning material consideration. Do you take account uh, in legal terms of something as a material consideration if it is self-inflicted or that there is insufficient effort made to raise the money? I mean, we're all sympathetic to the NHS, undoubtedly, but what this has to avoid being is an unofficial tax on housing development simply because NHS trusts cannot get their acts together on funding. Looking at the SIL regs, this is obviously a stumbling block uh, uh, if the NHS trust that's seeking um, uh, funding, uh, assuming it can get over the general uh, uh, hurdle uh, that I've just mentioned, uh, is going to have to meet the requirement of necessity to start with. And as a, a case with uh, Section 106 funding I was involved in a few years ago, the uh, uh, Police and Crown Commission for Leicestershire, the court won't interfere with the exercise of judgment by the planning authority applying uh, the uh, SIL tests uh, in Reg 122 uh, without uh, very clear com compelling evidence. In that case, it only related to funding of uh, some uh, contributions to the police, but the same principle applies generally. Now, there are a whole series of issues ar arise in practice, and I've advised numerous local authorities on these issues, and you see a, a variety of materials being advanced uh, on behalf of the trust. 
although um, there was a stage at which the same justification document was being repeated time and time again. First question has to be, is there a necessity if, as David Locke has indicated, there, there are mandatory breaches of the current mechanism and there are ways of obtaining it? The mere fact that it is difficult for a trust to get its head round its own funding mechanisms isn't a justification for imposing further costs on a development. Next question, do new houses equate to new population? That seems inherently unlikely because of household formation rates, existing inhabitants moving within the catchment. There is no simple equation which simply says, if I have 50 houses for two occupiers each, I've got 100 new uh, uh, occupiers and I've therefore got to get revenue uh, subsidy from those from the developer uh, to pay for the uh, uh, delivery of medical services. And the question is, is how the NHS Trust, if it is going to run this argument, justifies additional population as opposed to population uh, that is simply uh, coming into new housing. How, how, for example, are strains put on the funding resources of treating people from outside the catchment? To what extent do other factors, uh, if you look at the Trust's accounts, uh, play in terms of causing uh, the difficulty in the delivery of services? I have examined a large number of trusts accounts in the, in the, in the context of advising uh, uh, local authorities, and it is hard to discern any real issues arising simply from the number of uh, new occupiers of dwellings as opposed to other more generalised factors. And it seems to me there are difficulties of proof uh, uh, from that point of view as well to show necessity. Um, there's also the issue of the lag. Well, if it's a year's lag or a funding gap while uh, the NHS Trust uh, gets its act together on uh, new figures, well, what about the fact, uh, firstly, the lag may be a result of the lack of uh, application by the body of the uh, mechanisms available to it. Secondly, is there a strategy which seeks to take account of population growth through new housing? Because if you look at a number of joint strategic needs assessment, joint health and well-being strategies, you see frequently references to uh, local plans, housing allocations uh, and growth. And what about the lag that occurs with planning permissions generally? If, if the concern is a, a one or a two year uh, gap in funding while the figures catch up uh, because of the circumstances, well, what about the lag that's going to occur in in inevitably after the grant of planning permission, if it's a large development, you're very rarely going to get occupiers uh, uh, early within that period, particularly if reserve matters are needed. So what is the relationship of the gap to the likely timescale for the building out of a planning permission? The gap may not in reality be as great uh, as is contended or indeed may exist, may not exist at all. There is also the slightly concerning question what if legal advisors who are seeking to assist NHS trusts, and there are a number who are um, dealing with these issues, uh, are looking to achieve some sort of success fee? Um, I don't know, I haven't sought, haven't had legal proceedings, haven't seen any, any disclosure yet, but if there's a success fee element involved in these cases, this is something which needs to be looked at by local authorities, because it may again undermine an argument about necessity. Uh, there are issues, and um, all these issues overlap, directly related to the development, fairly and reasonably related in scale and kind. These all come back to the same sort of issues I've just been discussing. Uh, then there's the question of how do you secure that the funds are used for the relevant purposes and enforce them uh, or seek payback? Well, we already know from the reform uh, policy report that uh, NHS trusts are not handling uh, NHS contributions competently at the moment. Um, does it matter that all the uh, money comes out in the wash? Because it could be said, well, we've got a we've got a funding deficit, therefore whatever we add into it uh, improves our position. Well, that's an oversimplistic argument to begin with. And ELSIC and Resilient Energy suggest you've got to link the development uh, to the purpose of the obligations, and it's not sufficient simply to. Uh, uh, say, mind, uh, never mind the quality field width, we've got a huge deficit, just pay into that. But how do you demonstrate that it will go to those purposes? How do you monitor compliance? Is that going to be practicable for a planning authority? Do you require an auditor's certificate or something equivalent from the trust? Or do you require a senior office of the trust to give a statement of compliance um, uh, in, a, in a form which uh, 
can be proceeded with if uh, if it turns out to be untrue. It gives rise to enormous practical difficulties. Uh, oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, policy. Sorry, my mouse has gone slightly haywire. Policy doesn't really help uh, because it doesn't tell us very much at all. Uh, I, uh, I agree with, uh, with Dave that the uh, policy doesn't restrict uh, contributions any more than the law does to capital contributions only, but that's not with respect to the point in these cases. Um, there was uh, some uh, old uh, NHS guidance which has disappeared uh, now from uh, the uh, NHS website, securing 106 uh, and community infrastructure funds, a guide, which did raise a number of points. If you look at the quote at the bottom of the page, uh, which echo some of uh, the concerns that I've uh, explained, for example, uh, evidence, the legality of the claim and how new housing will impact on services. It's an interesting document and I'm slightly surprised it's vanished because it wasn't that old. Uh, there's the reform policy paper that I've already mentioned. 87 million worth of developer contributions, of which uh, 34 million over that period uh, studied currently unspent. Decisions. Well, uh, uh, Dave Fosdick and I take opposite views on uh, the Tenmouth case, which is uh, Wilbur Barton, and went to the court uh, in the Abbot Kurzweil uh, uh, Parish Council case. The difficulty uh, that those who rely on this have, and I take issue with what uh, Dave has said about it, is that the grant of permission, as the courts have frequently said, is not proof of anything. It's proof of arguability, not that the arguments are correct. And <laughs> the three of us must have demonstrated at the very least that the issue is arguable. Where the argument comes down is another matter. All, all the point about the grant of permission is that a judge thought that there was an issue to be looked at, uh, and it doesn't tell you anything other than there's a risk of judicial review. Uh, secondly, uh, it means that the, uh, there is a, a clear steer from the Secretary of State as to the sort of concerns which might arise. Um, and uh, you there see the uh, section of the inspector's report. Uh, he criticised uh, the, the trust because it, he said it couldn't have come as a surprise to them that there was new housing um, because uh, it was partly due to a confusion as to who in the NHS should be looking uh, at the local plan and liaising with the local authority. Uh, those are matters which may uh, impact in, in future cases. Uh, the fact that it's said by some that there is a factual error in this and therefore the decision can't be relied upon, nonetheless, doesn't alter the fact it remains a valid decision. And secondly, um, the, uh, uh, the concerns about how the information uh, percolates through the NHS is plainly one to which inspectors are alive, should the SU arise. Which brings me um, to the last point, and this includes the Ledbury decision that uh, Dave mentioned earlier. If you look at the majority of decisions that have come out uh, and which are relied upon by those saying this justifies the grant, uh, the, um, the uh, requirement of payments, in virtually every case, and in fact, every case I've seen, the uh, issue has not been contentious. The same is true of the Ledbury um, decision. Uh, the Secretary of State's decision does not discuss it. All it does is have one of those omnibus, I agree with what the inspector said about the Section 106 obligation, and it's little more than that. And if you look at what the inspector says, uh, it's a, in two short paragraphs in Section 15 of his, um, of his report, Section uh, paragraph 15.1 of the inspector's report makes it clear it was agreed by the developer, so it wasn't contentious. And uh, the justification of 15.3 and 15.6 is thin. Um, and it's based on a compliance statement and a statement from the NHS Trust. I have got a copy of the NHS, uh, the Hereford NHS Trust submission, which runs to little more than three pages and contains holes a mile wide in terms of the evidential issues that I've identified. And it goes to show that just because a decision may endorse the payment uh, or, or, uh, of a contribution to the NHS, that may be down to purely practic pragmatic considerations by the developer who decides it's not worth pursuing, just as the we don't know why uh, a payment was made in the judicial review in the Tenmouth case. It may simply have been the developer not wanting the delay or the doubt arising from it and wanting to get a shot of the issue. You simply don't know and therefore it is, uh, in my uh, view, um, foolish to place reliance on something which clearly has not been properly argued. 
that's it in a nutshell um, and why I'm much more skeptical of these cases than um, others may be. Um, and uh, hopefully there are a few more ideas on the slides uh, should you wish to think about them. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, if, if, if I could ask all uh, the speakers to come back on screen, uh, we have had a, a, a substantial number of questions and also quite a healthy debate going on uh, on Q&A whilst, the, um, whilst, whilst the, the speakers have been speaking. And we obviously aren't in a position in the course of the next seven minutes or so uh, to uh, do justice to all the questions. But um, one theme that I think has emerged is um, how, uh, if one assumes that in principle um, funding uh, to meet the alleged um, impact of uh, new housing developments, future occupiers on local NHS um, uh, uh, pr provision is, is a legitimate uh, uh, subject for um, planning contribution. Um, how, Dave Forsdick, on earth does the local planning officer who has to manage the planning application go about establishing uh, whether that is in fact uh, justified on the facts of the case? Yeah, um, this is a key question. Uh, and indeed, I think David Elvin said that he's uh, in, the, in the position of having to advise lots of local authorities on this. I, I've done so too. And it's a very difficult position for a local planning authority officer to be in. Um, uh, but my answer is that this will all be a matter of evidence. If, 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 a, if an NHS trust puts in three pages of gobbledygook, because David says was the case in Ledbury, then a, plan, a local planning authority officer won't take very long in, in realising it's, it's not worth uh, much and doesn't demonstrate that. If, if however, um, the NHS Trust answers all the questions that David Elvin raised, and I accept all of those questions are valid questions, you know, where is the gap, how does it arise, why, why is there population, why are you assuming population growth, what is the implication for services, why isn't the gap caught up later on, all those sorts of questions, all of which I agree with. If, if an NHS Trust uh, NHS Trust answers them all and puts together a detailed pack of material that shows that on the facts of the specific case there is an answer, there is a gap and there are implications of the gap, uh, then I would say in, in that situation, and it's all evidence driven, it's all how good is the evidence base, but in a situation where they answer all those questions and crucially where the other side is unable to rebut those answers, and that seems to me to meet the um, still one, two, three tests. Well, uh, that, of course, the elephant in the room with that is then the, uh, the questions raised by other David. Sorry, just to confuse everything, because you're all David. <laughs> um, if, if you do have uh, mandatory um, breaches uh, and you do have uh, effectively a self-inflicted gap, um, then, of course, you have difficulties getting over either the, le either the general legal hurdles of materiality or the general legal hurdle of necessity and fairly and reasonably related in the in the sill regs, yeah. and that's that's a big issue for the uh, which needs to be determined. Yeah. It wasn't what and, and, and the the Tinmouth case seems to indicate that the Secretary of State's uh, alive to that sort of question, um, uh, uh, and the fact that there may have been errors in that case, although as I said, not quashed, um, is irrelevant to the, to the the general thrust of what the inspector said. You wanted to come in, I think. Yes, I think planning officers are in a really difficult position here, but there are a number of absolutely key questions I think you need to ask the NHS Trust. Um, the first one is, what year are we talking about? Um, is it this year, next year, you know, and is it equated to when the development will actually roll out? Because it's only when people start turning up in the new houses that the issue is impacted. And that will be in a number of years time. So it's it's all about what's going to happen in two to three years time, not not now. Um, and are they doing that properly? If they're not, then it's just nonsense. Yeah. Secondly, um, um, uh, are they proposing in the future to follow the national tariff rules, assuming they're still in existence, in order to be to argue that they, with their CCG, that they should be funded for a fair amount, which is what the national tariff requires them to, for the patients that they reasonably anticipate, because they must be reasonably anticipating more patients in order to come to the developer 
for a contribution in the first place. Therefore, they must know they can have more patients. So the question they have to answer is, why aren't they using the rule, the tools they've got in order to say to the CCG, well, you've got to fund me for a fair price because there's mandatory rules on this. And therefore, um, why aren't, aren't I being funded? If they come out with, yes, we're, we're looking at the right period. And yes, these are the rules. That this is why we're, this is why we anticipate that our future negotiations will be unsuccessful. Um, the next question is whether they're in deficit. Because if they're in deficit, almost by definition, this won't work because the consequences of more funding will be to reduce the deficit, not to actually pay for extra doctors and nurses to treat patients. And if, there, if you can't demonstrate that, that the money will actually translate directly into doctors and nurses treating patients, I don't think it can work um, uh, for, for the reasons that both Davids have said so eloquently. Um, can I cut it, David, can I cut you off? Because we're, we're running yeah, just- Sure, that, 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 those are the questions well, I would ask. Sorry? Those are the questions a planning that's officer that's might ask. David Elvin, um, I, 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 one of the themes that's emerged from the chat is that um, a, a given developer uh, may have a very strong disincentive to, uh, to, to challenging uh, a request for funding uh, because of the uh, desire to get on with their development and the desire to avoid an appeal, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a way in which um, the terms of the 106 agreement or uh, it could be the planning obligations, et cetera, could be, uh, could be devised in order to give them some degree of control over the questions that David Locke's answer has just suggested are likely to come, for, come, to come forward later during the process of, of carrying out the development? Well, I, I, I'm afraid, again, this is a problem which is it's 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 just expecting local authorities to have to do too much. I mean, the practicalities of a local authority, a local authority planning enforcement department or uh, uh, or planners generally uh, having to demand uh, proof from a local authority before it hands over the money uh, that certain steps are taken uh, with a funding mechanism with which the NHS trusts themselves don't seem to understand. And recent experience or experience that David and I are having at the moment, not 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 get, naming any names, suggests that some trusts are unable to explain their own position. Um, I, I just I have real qualms about how you can expect uh, local authority officers to be able to do that. My yeah, sense is, that which uh, is which is why I mentioned all that stuff about certificates and auditors and that sort of thing. But it's yeah. it's not very satisfactory. I mean, my sense is that um, although the courts generally, uh, the planning court, the administrative court are generally fairly um, hands off when it comes to the way in which planning authorities um, uh, assess, evaluate the evidence uh, on, uh, uh, in relation to the planning application that's before them and the same on appeal. Where the, where, where the focus of the legislative framework is on whether uh, a, a burden on a developer can be justified on the basis of the evidence that is before the planning authority or the Secretary of State on appeal, which I think is a theme that's emerging from this talk, the court may, the judges may feel more confident in grappling with that kind of question in a rather more intrusive way than they might on something that might be described as pure planning merit. I don't know what Dave Fawcett thinks about that. Uh, absolutely, and, and that's why I was stressing throughout that it's a matter of, of what evidence is presented by the trust and can they overcome the hurdles that David Elvin and David Locke have put forward. That um, I, I had a situation where the trust did try to answer all of David Locke's questions uh, in, in, in broadly the order he put them actually, um, and, and the council couldn't find anything wrong with their answers. There might have been something wrong with their answers, but the council couldn't find anything wrong with their answers. Um, and so, uh, in that situation, you'd expect the courts to 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 say to the say to a, a claimant against the NHS trust, you know, um, what was what was the counter case? What was the what was the contrary case? My, yes. my, my, my solution to this problem, Dave, is to get David Locke instructed to tell, give them the answer to those questions. <laughs> Thank you. David Locke gets ten percent on that basis. <laughs> That's my success fee, is it? <laughs> I think on that on that uh, on that salutary note, uh, 
we've run out of time. I, I recognize that there's an awful lot of uh, questions and also uh, contributions on the Q&A, which we haven't had the time to go through individually. Um, thank you very much for that. We'll review those um, after the close of the session uh, and we'll see if we can provide some answers uh, to, to, to at least some of those questions uh, uh, when we circulate the, uh, the, the uh, webinar materials. But uh, thank you very much indeed, everybody, for attending. Uh, we hope you found it um, an interesting, stimulating debate. It, it certainly has seemed as such to me. I'm grateful to all of our speakers for uh, the very interesting and uh, uh, pointed contributions that they have made from different perspectives. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful to you all for attending. And uh, I'm going to close the seminar now. Uh, and as I said at the start of the, of the process, um, the, the, the recording and the course material, the seminar materials, will be circulated to you all uh, following, the, uh, following the closure of the webinar in, 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 in due course. So thank you very much indeed and, and goodbye. <laughs>